Good morning, everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, speaking about a, a paper that we published several years ago. This is an update of that paper now that the conference kind of shifted a few years. Uh, the paper is called Alliance at the Gate, Transdisciplinary Design of an Early Warning System to Improve Human-Lion Coexistence. So all across Africa, of course, there's been historic conflict between people and carnivores, a lot of it to do with uh, the, the development of domestication of livestock, and this has led to a tenuous coexistence. Uh, a lion is a large conflict species, especially in our study area. We estimate about 78% of conflicts that happen uh, between livestock farmers and carnivores are lions. Um, and so this has led to indiscriminate killing of lions uh, in the early stages of our work, primarily from poisoning. We work in the northern Akavango Delta uh, in northern Botswana. So, of course, the bottom of the map here, we're just left of center of the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Conservation Area. So our study area uh, includes this whole region between the northern Akavango and the border with Namibia. So our effective study area is about 2,500 square kilometers. But the area that we have research permits for that we're expanding our research to is over 13,000 square kilometers. Poisoning is, of course, uh, indiscriminate, and it affects lions as the target, but it also affects a, a bunch of other species. So when poisoning events happen, oftentimes we find uh, 40, 60 dead endangered vultures, dead hyenas, uh, jackals, and other species. So we focused on lions to try to uh, assess uh, environmental health by doing these interventions. <coughs> So <laughs> what can be done when you're facing this crisis? And in the year 2013, about half of the lion population in our region were killed uh, through poisoning and shooting. So this was a pretty desperate situation. So one of the first things we did was deploy uh, lion collars, um, satellite tracking collars. We get locations every uh, two hours, so 12 locations a day. Uh, we created a cloud-based cloud-based algorithm to calculate um, the movement of lions and how it relates to the villages, and I'll explain how that works in a moment. Uh, and then we developed a messaging format to deliver real-time alerts to people when lions were approaching villages. Another piece of this to try to get away from indiscriminate killing was to individualize cats. So we, when we call it an animal, we went to the village and then we would do a naming ceremony. So we would ask people from the village to give a name to the cats. So the names varied quite a lot. Um, names like Mayenga, which means decorated by the gods, Mutluan Kanda, which means the farmer, Kufa Kuduzi, which means if you come from my cattle, I will find you. <laughs> um, and Shedapatira, which means uh, the one that belongs to us. So there's a lot of variation in these naming ceremonies. Uh, this one, you can see on the board, the name The Beast was one name. Uh, there's another name that I can't pronounce that actually meant constipated. <laughs> and then the last one, Mar Mariri, which means Big Mane. And luckily, Big Mane got the most votes, and we didn't have to call him constipated forever. Um, so once these callers go on, and once we name these cats, um, then we... Uh, put these colors into this algorithm, and this is what it looks like on the computer. So our collaborators at the University of Siegen in Germany uh, created this system. So each one of these circles is a geofence that we generate ourselves. So we go to the different cattle posts, we talk to people, we ask them if they want to be part of the system, um, we take a GPS location, and we take their phone numbers and names, and then we put their GPS location into the algorithm. The algorithm, then we can uh, create that geofence. We can change the size. So right now, all the cattle posts here, the smaller circles are about three kilometers radius. And then the larger circles are the, uh, the five villages in our area, which is a five kilometer radius. If we're finding that it's not effective, we can shrink them or grow them however uh, we want to do that. 
So right now we have 33 geofences, but uh, next week, if we added several people, we could add another three or four or five or a hundred, uh, however many we need. So basically, the, for the data acquisition, the data goes directly from uh, the caller through satellites in real time. Uh, we also put trackers on cattle for a period of time. So if the cattle move close to where the lion is, it can trigger an alert uh, to the owner of those cattle. Uh, it goes into the um, algorithm that then calculates the distance between the lion and any individual geofence. Then it distributes an alert to the specific person who's within that geofence that's uh, subscribed to our system. And uh, then it elicits a response, uh, either herding the cattle, uh, bringing them into a crawl, and so forth. Um, we, we're also looking to generate a more interactive system within the villages where we have uh, iPads where people can come and learn information about the movements of the lions and have it be a little bit more uh, interactive over time. So we're in the process of looking at that. When people receive the alerts on their phone, it looks like this. You have the name of the lion approaching which village or cattle post and then the distance. Uh, and so this is helpful because people can judge like how much of an emergency it is at the time. Uh, most of these alerts come in at night, so uh, depending if you know the lion is within a kilometer, a lot of people don't want to leave their homes and they want to make sure that their kids are safe. Uh, if they're 2.9 kilometers away, they might be able to go out and make sure that their cattle are in a crawl or, or something like that. So for our results, we have 250 uh, recipients of alerts. Uh, and, and if it's one per household, there's five people per household. That's 750 people that are directly receiving information from the system at any given time. We've got 33 geofences that are uh, five uh, villages, 28 cattle posts. Uh, the number of alerts that have been dispersed over the last four years is over 31,000. And the number of conflicts that have occurred in this system have actually remained relatively stable. So this hasn't really taken root as much as we'd like, and I'll explain why in a moment. But over the years, you can see 2019, uh, when the system started, 630. 2020, we had over 10,000. 2021, 12,000. Last year, we had uh, over 7,000 alerts uh, dispersed. Where we're seeing uh, the alerts happening are these uh, primary geofences. Um, Gunasoka village, which is right here, uh, had the most 18,000 alerts over that four year period. Uh, Aretza village here um, had uh, over 4,000 uh, 4, alerts, and then these smaller cattle posts here. So not only is this uh, an artifact of the movement of specific lions, Itola, the Tonga, which were part of a coalition, um, Zaquero's mate and Sacharo, but also it's an artifact of where we had our callers out. Um, you know, we're trying to collar more animals in this side of the study area, and I think that that would elicit more alerts on this side as well. So how do people respond? Um, so we, we've done a series of questionnaires over the years. Uh, last year we did one. Uh, we interviewed 70 people, half being recipients, half not recipients. 88% um, saw that this was a beneficial system. 53% um, of, of recipients take preventative action. We definitely want to improve that. If only half the time the alerts go out, people actually do something that's not really the kind of uh, response we're looking for. So we're hoping to try to uh, come up with ways to uh, support people to actually get out and do things once the alerts come in. Uh, so many people, almost 70% contact neighbors, uh, they'll crawl their cattle, uh, they'll light small fires outside of the crawl, and usually that's uh, a decent deterrent at least for a night. Uh, 93% uh, said that they have shared responsibility. So when they receive an alert, it's not entirely up to clause to do something. They feel that they have a, a role in this uh, process as well, which is good. 65% uh, requested a direction with the alert. And we've been very um, 
we've been very hesitant to do that. We've, we've gone into uh, communal meetings where some people say, just give us the direction so we know where to bring our cattle or so that we know where we can let our children play. And then the next person gets up and says, I want to know I'm going to shoot that thing. So it's really hard to try to balance those two things. And I think it leads to greater conversations with people about how we're going to uh, make this work. Uh, we do have the capability to give a direction. So it's a matter of like finding the right balance uh, with people to ensure that we're not um, bringing people in the direction to just start killing lions. And we have had people use alerts in the past to kill lions. But when we go to those village meetings, all the people in the village actually stand up and point him out and say, you killed this lion. Now we have no information. Why did you do that? At least we got alerts when we knew where the lion was. Okay, so some of the limitations, of course, is costs involved, uh, particularly around the collaring. Uh, it's approximately $34,000 a year if we're at maximum uh, number of collars. We need to put out about 13 callers to cover all of the different uh, social groups, the prides and coalitions, to make the system comprehensive in our system. So that's pretty significant. We need a cell phone network, and luckily in Botswana that's possible. Um, farmer response, uh, like I said, 53% uh, response rate when uh, recipients get an alert. We, we want to boost that up. And uh, livestock husbandry and unattended cattle is our, our, our biggest issue. So um, what we've done is created a response team now. At the end of last year, some of the uh, results that we got from these questionnaires was we need help uh, actually uh, finding where these lions are and chasing them away. So one of our staff members uh, receives all the alerts for all the geofences, gets in a vehicle, calls people from that village, volunteers that jump in with him. They find the lion. We've been shooting firecrackers at them. <laughs> um, but it works quite well. I mean, we've seen that the lions move between seven and nine kilometers away within a couple hours of the firecrackers going off. So we feel like this is a good step now, but we can monitor uh, how quickly lions habituate to this kind of response and then adapt it uh, as needed. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for two very quick questions then. Um, the lady at the back? Okay. Thanks. Hey, Andrew. Um, <laughs> awesome talk. Thanks. I was just wondering what you think are some of the techniques for getting that preventative response percentage to go up, and also if you think that the reason that it's only 53 is because people are becoming habituated to the alerts, you know, because there's so many alerts. Yes, so getting that percentage up, I think one of the problems, honestly, that we had, uh, we started this system uh, just before COVID. So actually getting into the uh, villages, talking to people, um, trying to get them on board uh, became a challenge. What ended up happening was we would deliver alerts and there wasn't a lot of follow up. So I think people, especially when lions are active at night, they receive an alert in the middle of the night and then what am I supposed to do with this? And they're scared and then they, you know, they might go back to sleep. So now that they know that we're out there and that we're more uh, in, engaging more with people and we're actually proactively going out to speak to people and, and uh, confronting the lions and trying to haze them a bit, I'm hoping that that's, that's going to increase. Uh, one thing that I didn't mention with these alerts, we actually deliver them either text or voicemail, English or Setswana, depending on their uh, preferences. So we're trying to target them with the most actionable message that they can receive. And, uh, and so we're, we're adapting it as we go. But um, yeah, we're hoping that that's going to help us now that COVID restrictions are removed. Thanks. It's um, a bit of a follow on from that question. We've been talking a lot during this conference about how to measure success. And it strikes me that actually if you're engaging with more farmers and they're doing the correct mitigation, then your response rate might get lower, right? Because they don't need to do anything extra because they're already doing all of the things that they would need to do to protect themselves when that lion does come close. So I was just wondering if you can also have some sort of measure 
which factors into that you might get lower than 50% because 70% of your farmers are already protected. They don't actually need to respond to that alert. That's a great way to interpret <laughs> what we're seeing. Um, I, that, I agree with you. Um, and I think that hopefully we can get closer to that. I definitely feel that within our area, aside from like our communal herding, there's very little uh, husbandry happening, unfortunately. So I think as we, as we receive uh, these alerts and as we're interacting with people, hopefully we can, um, we can create those interventions then, and so people don't have to do as much. Yeah, that would be ideal. Thank you, Andrew.